Join the Brave Enough podcast with Julianne Williams. Renew, recreate, recover you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my podcast. It's Julianne Williams. It's Brave Enough, Renew, Recreate, Recover You. I have a really special guest today. She happens to be a friend of mine and my neighbor, um, and we go back a lot of years I was listening to her on Facebook the other night and realized that she had a really big message to share with the folks who listen to this podcast about grief. So I'd like to introduce you to Jill O'Bannon. She is the mother of six children, but is also a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, and is doing a lot of exciting things in her life. And um, I'm just really proud to be her friend. What we're going to talk about today is something that she and her family have struggled with, and it's it's sort of a twofold issue. One is going to talk about the drug uh, addiction and the drug problem that we have, the crisis in our country, and then the other thing about a little bit about the grief of being a parent, uh, walking your child through and your other children through drug addiction in your family. So with that, I am going to, again, introduce Jill to you. And ask her to tell us a little bit about herself and what she would like to share with us on, you know, just the last few years that they have walked their child through a very serious drug addiction. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm really excited also to share my story because I think it's so important and I don't think people are honest about it all the time. I think it's sometimes something you can be ashamed of as a mom and even as a family to be dealing with someone in your family that has addiction. And like you said, I have six kids. I own um, some retail stores in our hometown and um, my husband and I are always looking for the next fun adventure to be on. And um, that's a little bit, that's kind of me, a little synopsis of me. But um, six years ago, uh, we put our second son in rehab for the first time. And he spent his 16th birthday in rehab. And over the last six years, we've gone to hell and back. And what started with um, alcohol and cocaine, it actually started with Adderall that he would take to get his AP homework done ended up going to cocaine because cocaine was cheaper. And so he didn't have to hide that money. He would use his lunch money to buy cocaine. Um, And now he is sitting in a jail cell and is a habitual fentanyl addict, meth, heroin, crack, alcohol, pot, you name it. He's, he does it. So um, it's, it's a story I think that's so important because we are just a normal family. We're just a normal family. Like Julianne said, we live on her street. Um, we aren't the stereotypical um, family where this should quote unquote be happening. Um, and my son went from 4.0 student um, who played sports um, had his eye set on USC to be an engineer, um, to living on the streets and being homeless, um, in cities like Dallas and Phoenix and LA. So, um, it's, it's quite a story to tell and, and the grief behind it too, right? As a mom, um, when you had all these expectations and dreams for your child and to see them not, not happen is hard. I think that's what I was talking about the other night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we all have a so, dream, right? For what we think everything is going to look like. And loss isn't just death. Grief doesn't come from just death and loss. Grief comes from losing anything that is of value to us, um, whether it be a person, person not being a thing, but, you know, or a situation or, you know, whatever it is that makes you wish and want for something different. Right. And I mean, even as me as a parent, you know, I have six different children and six different roads they're going to be on, six different journeys, six different personalities, all from the same home. And um, we've all had to grieve the loss of one child's life, not, not physically his life, but his life with us. 
And, um, you know, my, my girls lost their big brother who's nowhere around, which they thought he would be around. And my oldest son lost his little brother and, um, to this addiction and, and yeah, he's not dead, right? He's alive, but, but he's not here and he misses Christmases and he misses, you know, all kinds of things. And I can remember, um, his, the, the, when he was in rehab, his, it was his junior year and, um, his little sister, Molly, um, is two years younger and they had always joked that when she started high school, he would get to drive her to her first day of school. And I remember that morning waking up and Molly came into my room and she was just sobbing. Oh. And she said, he was supposed to drive me to school. Like mom, he was supposed to drive me to school. And so, right, it's grief. And she's had to process that. She's had to work through it. She's had all the things that someone who, you know, loses someone um, physically um, kind of goes through as well, right? Like I think grief is the same in a lot of situations. It doesn't have to necessarily be losing someone to death, but, um, and she's gone through all the stages, resentment and anger and sadness and all of that. And she's had to work herself through it. And um, it's been a really hard thing to watch. Um, at the same time, it's been um, a joy to watch her change and to see her shift her view of the world and to have grace and compassion where she probably wouldn't have it. Um, and she is, she's a beautiful gone. young woman. Yeah, she, is. she is. She just opened her own store. So I know. You know. I know. I need to be in town and visit it. I know. I know you do need to come in, but. Um, so yeah, it's just been, I think the other day on Facebook, I was really talking to about parents about, you know, testing your kids and just being aware and, and because it's, 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 I just don't want any mom to have to go through what I've gone through because it, it's been hell. It's been absolute hell. And there's been several times for me that I've had to really process, would it be easier if he died? Because then that grief would start, we would process it, it would be, you know, he's gone, and it wouldn't be this, oh, he's better, we have joy, and oh, now he's not, let's grieve it again. And so it's mm -hmm. kind of a roller coaster. And that's a hard thing to even admit as a mom, Yeah. that there's been times that I felt like that. So, um, yeah. Been hard. Yeah. It's been hard. And you know, I think uh, like we talked before the podcast and um, part of the thing, so we live in a small town and it's a beautiful little town and it's a great place to raise kids. It's a great place to live. Um, but in our town, sometimes we don't recognize all of the things that are happening under current. And I'm not criticizing um, at all. Uh, I'm, live in that town. So what I'm saying right. is that part of what I think the awareness too, that I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about is, you know, how do these things happen? Because, um, you know, there's a, there's a crisis and drugs are very easily accessible to kids. Um, I mean, we know now with the fentanyl that they're making fentanyl that looks like candy, um, you know, right. it's just, it's a really big problem. And as parents, it's hard for us to think about our kids getting involved, especially like you said, there's no good reason for them, but getting involved in the world of drugs and how, how do we know, or how do we ever figure that out? Cause I know you've done a lot of searching, um, back and figuring things out. Right. Because I, you know, the other day too, I was saying, I, I, people came to me people came to me and they said, something's going on with him. And I'm like, eh, whatever, you know, Jill, something's going on. And I would, you know, I always would attribute it to pot. I always. Well, yeah, he's probably smoking some pot. And I talked to him and he'd be like, mom, I tried it. And, you know, I just always took his word for it. And I never, I never really keyed in on the fact that multiple parents were telling me there was something wrong multiple people were coming to me saying, Hey, I saw Carson. He didn't look right or multiple people. And what got in my way was my pride, not my kid, not my kid. And I think as parents, 
we we have we have to listen when those people say that and, and we have to admit to ourselves something is wrong something is going on because even if they're not doing drugs they're doing something to make people think they're doing drugs right so like there's something there's something going on there and um you gotta test your kids you gotta test your kids i, I just i think you test your kids regardless if people are telling you stuff's going on and to stop just to know and i i said the other night too or I say all the time, the minute your child puts up a fight to do that drug test, you have a problem. Yep. You have a big problem. And I, that's the easiest, that's the easiest test right there. If you watch this and you have high school kids or even junior high kids and you say, you know what, I'm going to start drug testing you. If they say, okay, you're probably okay. If they say, no, why? That's stupid. Hmm you might have a problem. And so I think, you know, there is so much undercurrent of, of drugs in every town. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just start open and honest with what's going on in our own families and share each other's burdens and share each other's grief, mm -hmm. um, I think it would really change the direction the country's going in. Um, because it, the country's going in a bad, bad, direction when it comes to opiates and fentanyl it's rampant even in our little town in fact my son overdosed in our town in my house we found him dead and uh, my husband did perform cpr and brought him back but it was on a fentanyl actually fentanyl and meth overdose so um i just can't i just can't get it enough and i think i was saying this earlier too to you if I help, I mean, if I help one mom, I've, I've done something by opening my mouth. Just one. I don't want any brothers or sisters or moms or dads or grandmas or aunts or uncles to ever have to go through what my family's gone through because it's been hellacious, to say the least, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's taking a lot of courage for you to step out and talk about this because... You know, like you said, um, we do as parents, we just don't want to acknowledge that our kids are doing anything wrong because we love them so much and we see them as so perfectly made. And um, I think we have such high hopes for what we think they are and what they're going to be. And it's hard to sit back and um, think about your child doing something that they know that you've taught them is wrong and something that would be harmful. How did you first figure out that Carson was heavily involved in drugs that was beyond marijuana? Um, we, his behavior became pretty erratic. Um, we would catch him in a lot of the lies. A lot of people had told us they'd seen him at parties or going to parties. And um, in all honesty, what really blew us away was um my daughter posted an instagram picture that she had taken of him and when we saw the picture we were like oh my gosh he is thin he is thin and you know they say you know you don't you don't notice you you put on a pound every couple of weeks you know for six months and now you're up however many pounds and you didn't realize it right because it's slow and steady yep. and because we lived with him we didn't really he was getting taller and we kind of just attributed it to that and and um but ultimately his behavior his grades started to slip um his stories weren't consistent um just a lot of things that I think we could have easily attributed to just being a high school kid right mm -hmm. just being a teenager lying to their parents and um we did a drug test and cocaine came up on it and um I didn't know what to do as a mom because number one if I admitted that this was a problem I had failed as a parent I had failed and number two I didn't know if I didn't do anything what was going to happen was it going to get worse how could we control it we couldn't control it he was you know, 
getting drugs dropped off the house, we would find baggies and we started going through his room and, and we would do all these things. And, and, um, it, it just became to the point where I literally called my insurance and I was like, I think he needs rehab, but I had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. Like there was nobody that I could have called and said, okay, is this bad enough to go to rehab or is right. this something as a parent I need to try and handle myself? Right. Um, and because of that, we put him in rehab. Um, I, on a monthly basis, probably question that decision a lot if I put him in there too soon. Because guess what? When you put addicts in rehab, they meet other addicts Aww. who do different drugs, <laughs> who teach them about different drugs. Interesting. And so, yeah, so he came home with a lot more information than he had prior to going to rehab. So, um, well, how, I mean, I that, that is not even something I would think about. You think I'm putting that yeah. person in a safe environment. They're going to be with professionals. You know, it's going to no, be working. They're addicts. They're with other addicts and addicts share their stories and addicts talk about what they use and what kind of addict they are. Are they an alcoholic? Are they shooting up? Are they meth? Are they crack cocaine? You know, there's all these different things. And, um, you know, he tells me that all the time. I came home knowing more about drugs than I went there with. And those words play in my mind a lot because I try to, I check myself and I have a little bit of guilt from that because I, which I know it's not my fault. Which I was going to say, you know, the thing, Jill, is that, I mean, I, I can absolutely see why you feel that way. Because, you yeah. you know, you're like, whoa, he came back knowing more. I think he would have found that out no matter what. So, you know, so I hope that you can release some of that. Because I think yeah. what you did was a very good thing. I mean, right. uh, like I said, I, I, you think you have one perception and then there's this other thing. So now at least people know, like you're, that's a great thing for people to know. Like, okay, if I'm going to choose rehab for my child, they may come out knowing more than they went in knowing. On the other hand, they probably find it out anyway. At least you took a step. You acknowledged it. You took a step and you, you know, did what was, especially at the time, the best thing you could do. Right. At the time it was. And, um, you know, he, um, between the next six years, between the ages of 16, he turned 22 in August. He's been in upwards of 35 rehabs, um, between California, Texas and Phoenix. And, um, he graduated from high school early because he did it online because he was in rehab. Um, and you know, I think that was the first No, I'll tell you the first loss for me as a parent and something I really had to grieve, which was really hard for me. And I still actually have not been back to the baseball field at the high school um, is he loved baseball and he loves his uncle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my brother played major league baseball and he always wanted to be like my brother and he was left-handed like my brother. And and so um, his senior year, my brother started coaching varsity baseball for the high school. Mm. And he went to school his senior year, first day, high as a kite. He had been up for probably multiple days um, on crack cocaine and Xanax and alcohol. And he walked in, he he went to a senior sunrise, which I don't think he actually went to. And um, he, he went to school, came back that first day of his senior year and um, we put him in rehab the next day. And so he spent most of his senior year in rehab. Um, and that was a hard loss for me yeah. as a mom Yeah, to watch his friends have their senior year baseball. And he didn't have that. And he always wanted my brother to coach him and his addiction took that away. It took it away from him. It's a regret he has. He can't hardly talk about it. He'll start crying. And my brother still coaches, you know, baseball at the high school and I can't go to a game. I, I just can't because there's such a loss of innocence for my son who should have been able to play baseball, mm-hmm. but he became a drug addict and, um, he, you know, he made the decision to try drugs and try alcohol. And I also say this all the time, 
something in him genetically, some way he's hardwired to be an addict and it's a disease for him. And yes. a lot of people won't agree with me. It's a big um, controversy, controversy in the medical world. Um, but I have two sons and they party together and one is not an addict and one is. And so um, there's just a lot of grief and a lot of loss there as a parent to watch your son or your daughter go through that kind of stuff and things you thought you were gonna see them do, they didn't do. He didn't walk at graduation with his friends and you know, he sits in a jail cell today and his friends come in with their wives and their babies. And so as a parent, it's really hard it's really hard to watch that and and um, and see that and to watch your other kids go through it and know how to maneuver through that loss and that grief of a normal life, whatever that, that is supposed to be. I don't really think there's a normal life, but I don't either. we all have this misconception, right? Well, I mean, I think... Uh, you know, I interviewed somebody on my podcast last week and what they said is a pleasant life. Yes. And I love that. Um, it, it's right. so true. That's right. We just want a pleasant life. No chaos. Right. You know, no confusion. Um, just right. pleasant. It's not going to be perfect, but it can be pleasant. Well, well, yeah. And I mean, I, I just last week, I think I said to my mom, and my husband, like, when's enough enough? Mm-hmm. You know, when's enough enough? Like, I, I'm done. I'm done. Like, I just want to be done with the grief, right? Yeah. I want to be done processing it. I want to be done. And um, I, it's not in the cards yet, I don't think. <laughs> well, you know, we have the new. And, and his story is not, his story is pretty extraordinary. I mean, it. And if you would have told me this was going to be our story, I would have laughed at you because it's the stuff TV shows are made of, Mm -hmm. what I've seen and what I've done and what my son's been through. So, no, I mean, I, when you were talking, I can't imagine the, like you said, you guys have been out looking for him on streets, not knowing, you know, where he is, um, the, the, just how helpless you must feel. You know, because you can't change the decisions that he's making. But then also to know that, I mean, you, you're, you know, you feel better that he's in jail because, you know, he's safe and can't do drugs. Well, and it's funny you say that because I think once my husband and I both, both, um, switch the switch, the switch in our mind or whatever to the fact that we are helpless. Mm Mm-hmm. I am helpless against this addiction. I cannot control it. Mm-hmm. I can't fix it. There's nothing I can do. And the minute we did that, the shift in us changed. The sadness didn't change. It almost increased it, right? Because there's a little bit of hope. If you think, oh, I'm going to go, you know, there were years where we thought, okay, we're going to put him in this rehab and this is the time. And this is going to work and it didn't work. And so then we'd be down and then we'd be, Oh, we found a better rehab and we're going to put him in it. And, um, you know, he was in Betty Ford. He, I mean, he did 90 days in Betty Ford and actually that ended up being the worst place. It was the best place for his addiction where he got sober, um, and he was very, I mean, he was like solid sober. I don't know if that means anything, but, and he ended up being body brokered out of there, um, which is something that a lot of people don't know about with addiction, but. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what body brokering is. Right. So body brokering in the addiction world is um, insurance pays money. And if you have good insurance, rehabs want you. And so what a lot of these not so clean rehabs will do is they will plant people in high dollar rehabs and they will get to know these kids and they will convince them to leave. And so Carson made a friend that he convinced him to leave and very long story short, um, he had a relapse. He ended up in a, this is a really good rehab mom. Like I've met the guy, the guy called us. 
I've got your son. It's going to be great. Like, I just need your insurance info. This is all my information. I'm a recovering addict, whatever. And um, the kid that became my friend, my son's friend in, at Betty Ford was probably paid um, $7,500 to take my son to that rehab because our insurance at the time was one of the better rehab insurances. And so they plant these people to find these kids or people, adults that have really good insurance. And if they can get them into these different um, rehabs, they actually pay them cash. And so um, that, that changed his whole, that is when he actually became um, an opiate an addict. He had not done any opiates. He had never shot up heroin and that rehab owner actually shot him up for the first time. And it was a dirty rehab. So when we learned that we were helpless, there was some freedom in that. At the same time, there was then the grief of being helpless, right? It was like a double-edged sword. Yeah, because we, at least you, when you're not helpless, you feel like you can, might be able to fix it. And so now... Right. You, you are at the place where you know that, you know, there's only so much you can or could have done. And now it's up to Carson to make the decision. And he may never make that decision. Well, and, you know, I, I do think, you know, that there is a, a gene around addiction. I We've seen it in my family on my dad's side. Um, and th- there have been a, a couple of people who have had significant alcohol problems, one that pretty much died from that and um, raised the same. My, my dad didn't drink at all. Um, a, right. a lot of it because of what he saw, but, but he, he just said, look, I'm not going to put myself at risk. I, I do believe that there, there is that existence. And, um, you know, one thing that you said too, that I really like um, on that Facebook um, live that you did is, you know, we tend to judge people who become addicted to drugs or alcohol that as weak or, less than or whatever you want to label it. But, you know, the people who are addicted started the same way that most of us start. I'm going to go watch the football game with my kids tonight uh, because it's our team's playing and I will be having a glass or two of wine. So, um, so let's talk about that for a minute because that's a choice I'm going to make. And um, Carson made a very similar choice. He decided to try something. Well, I mean, how many high school kids make that same choice? And, you know, I know there's like a huge um, also, you know, debate about marijuana and I won't go into how I feel about all that stuff. But, you know, the minute you choose to try something, be it alcohol, a drug, anything, you have made the same choice my son made. Mm -hmm. Only he couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could put ourselves in that headspace as a society, I think the, I, th- I just, I think the thought behind addicts and how we think of them and how we view them and would change. And I think it would then change with the homeless community because a lot of them are addicts mm-hmm. and their addiction has stripped them of every financial means they've had. And, um, I, I just think, I think there could be a shift in the thought process behind so many people in the judgment they have with drug addicts, alcoholics, homeless, all of those things. If we all realize we made the same decision, mm-hmm. we made the same choice. And, you know, my son also broke his hip his sophomore year um, playing baseball and, you know, he's given painkillers, didn't help matters. And so even there, have you ever had a surgery? Have you ever taken a Vicodin? Have you ever taken, you know, all those different pills, sometimes it triggers something in you if you have that, that, um, I don't know. The predisposition. Yeah, Yeah, that predisposition. Yeah, that predisposition. Like you could, it it could be not even alcohol or like a a street drug. Absolutely. It could be any kind of anything. And um, you made the same choice. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just think there would be a shift in judgment if people could grasp that and really internalize it. 
when they see an addict, an alcoholic, and homeless person that struggles and know I'm just, I'm probably one gene away from that. Mm -hmm. I'm one gene away. Well, and, and I think even from a healthcare standpoint, you know, you and I have talked in the past about, you know, my husband suffering from bipolar disorder and having a really hard time getting treatment for him. You know, mental health and addiction are, are just very closely related yeah. and we don't have a good system. And if, if we could change our view, what that does is, so when people care about an issue, and we'll use Alzheimer's disease as a really good example, since yeah. I worked in uh, elderly care for so long, and, I, and it is a big issue, and it needs to be researched, it needs right. to be looked at, we need to have right. compassion for people that get it. Right. We, right. When we do that, though, we, we put dollars towards it. You know, we put our money where our mouth is for things that we can identify with, for things that we think aren't people's fault. And, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to something like mental health, because, you know, some people still think that's a some choice or drug use, again, in some ways a choice, but some ways not so much. Um, When we recognize things in a non-judgmental way, which is what we do with cancer, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, cardiac problems, we, we see those as, part of a human condition if we could do the same thing maybe we would take better steps in the united states to get treatment options out there for people because then it's not this huge stigma right well i mean even look at just as you were talking something clicked in my head like even look at the fentanyl epidemic right now you know it's on every news show it's billboards all of that and money's being thrown at it because people are overdosing on it but the people that are overdosing on it are not a lot of them addicts right so they don't have that stigma attached to them and we're throwing money at it because it's accidental and it's these kids are at a party it looks like candy they don't know what they're taking it it was an accident they're not an addict and we're throwing money at it but the minute you say this person is an addict and they're a fentanyl addict and they take it on the regular it 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 kind of depletes the urgency Mm-hmm. because people see that as a choice. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah, because it's... it's My son is a fentanyl addict. Yeah. I mean, he is a fentanyl addict. He yeah. smokes fentanyl, and he's on the street probably every 30 minutes um, to keep his high, and he's been doing that for about a year. And now the fentanyl has just become because the border and the, all these mm-hmm. things, you know, and some people are throwing money at it. And it's just really interesting to me as you were talking about that, that it, the stigma, it, the, the stigma is just, is, is really strong. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's very hard to overcome and all of it's bad. You know, I mean, getting at a party and not knowing what you're getting, it could happen to any innocent child because they're children at these yeah. parties. Let's be real. They're teenagers they're yeah. children. They're children. And they're at these parties and, and they think they're doing one thing and it's something else. And that is horrible. Um, you yes. know, but then it's also horrible that someone has a stigma attached to what their situation is. And because of that, they can't get treatment or they're, they're looked at in a way where they don't, people don't think they deserve it. And, and that's, that's a tough, and when it's your kid, that's not a good place to be. It's not fun. And and, you know, our son um, was afforded very good rehabs because we had, it, we had an income and we had very good insurance. And now he doesn't have as good insurance, right? Um, he's 22. He's on his own. And us trying to find him a good place to go, not even a good place, a place to go is super, super hard. And he has a family fighting for him. He has a mom and a dad and five siblings and grandparents and aunts and uncles and my friends and, and my community that, that lifts us up in prayer on a regular basis that will call me and say, hey, I heard about this place or, you know, whatever. And what about the people who have nobody? How are they supposed to get help? Yeah, they don't. They yeah. can't. They don't. They can't. Yeah. They can't. And so something has to change. And I think it starts with, I think it starts with judgment, which is an age old problem in today's society. Well, and, you know, I think 
um, you know, that's why I really asked you if you would be willing to talk about this because the more we talk about it, you know, the more the awareness, but you know, I like, you know, it happens to all of us. Like this is not some problem that happens to other people. And so we all need to be aware. And until, you know, we keep talking about it to, to this, that's how we remove the stigma. Because you have a beautiful family. You live in a beautiful home, in a beautiful city, you know, Christian. I mean, every every advantage in life this child right. had. I'm not the, he's not the stereotype. If you yeah. were to see him on the, the street, first of all, he doesn't look what well, he looks like. He, he belongs there. But he's not, you know, he just, all the things that people can blame on addiction, all the right. social, right. you know, whatever, whatever it would be, he doesn't have. Right. And he shouldn't be as bad of an addict as he is by society's standards. Right. If that makes sense. Totally. Uh, and, you know, and so it's why we talk about it and it's why we're so open about it because something has to change. I don't know. I don't know how to change it. I'm just a mom of six kids that is willing to talk about it. Um, and, you know, be just be really open and honest about our story and what we've gone through and how, you know, it's affected us. Yeah. And it's, it's deep. It's addiction is deep in grief and sorrow and loss. And it, it, I just don't want any other family to have to go through it because it's, it's, I would, I say this, I wouldn't wish on the worst enemy. Yeah. I don't know who that would be, but I just, yeah. I wouldn't do it. I, there's no way. Yeah. You said that last It's week. awful. So <clears throat> with that said, if, if you're, you know, if you're in a situation right now where, you know, you're experiencing grief from a situation similar to this, you know, you have a child that has taken a path that is very, very difficult. Um, and it's really been hard on your family and, and you're just so concerned and, and you feel loss over what you thought would have happened. Can you give anybody, you know, that's listening here some advice on, you know, what's gotten you through? Because I know you have battled. You've been a warrior. It has been a battle for sure. Um, I think what has gotten me through, honestly, is talking about it and being open and honest and admitting that it's rough and admitting that it's hard and sharing vulnerabilities that aren't always the easiest to share and trying to find my circle because I had found the minute I started to share what was really going on in my life, I had these people that just started coming alongside of me who were coming alongside my kids. You know, I have a sweet little old lady. She's like 70 and she calls my daughter just because her brother was a drug addict growing up. But it's because I talked about it and because I shared about it. And unfortunately we can't fix addiction for the addict our kids they ultimately make those decisions and that's really hard but the sooner we accept that the the easier I don't want I want to say the easier our life will be because it's not easy but it's it 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 takes some pressure off right it becomes more manageable if that makes sense yeah yeah it does. right it's, it's it's I can't I can't control it and I had nothing I can do because let me tell you, I've done it all and I've, I've tried it all. There's nothing I have not done. And I can stand here and say that. And the people who have walked with me for six years could stand here and say this. I and my husband have done everything possible and we have spent a lot of money trying to fix this addiction and it has not, it hasn't, he's got to make the decision. Yeah. I would say get a good community. I, I, it's the only way I've been able to do it. And it's why I started my Instagram page too, because I've had people private message me and say, thank you for sharing. I didn't know that there were other people going through this. And so I just think when you find those, those, those people, um, I always say in a project, many hands make light work. Mm -hmm. 
And I even think in these situations, right? Mm -hmm. Many hands make life easy. Yeah. If you're being lifted people. Yeah. So, um, hopefully you can, maybe you'll text that your Instagram to me so I can link it below for people who want to follow you and get in touch with you. If you know, just at least like you said, just, it's so, you know, one thing, and the reason I, I do this is, um, you know, after I lost my husband, I just felt really alone. And, and then I started helping people who had had the same experience. And I realized that, um, you know, when you stick together, uh, it feels a lot better. You know, you you, you realize that you're not alone because you aren't alone. Right. And I've even, right. And I mean, real quick too. I, I mean, I've even had a husband reach out to me and be like, my wife's an addict. I don't know how to handle it. Mm-hmm. We have kids. And, and so it's, it's not just, parents who have addicts you know I talk to husbands and wives too that message me and it's all the same because we're so helpless yeah yeah and you can't let it out of them yeah I've tried yeah I know I know you love your kiddos I know that for a fact (laughs) (laughs) I've known you a long time and I've watched you with your kiddos and you love them you have you have actually Yes, and you love you. Our love. oldest kids are the same age. I know, I know. Except I'm a little bit older than you. Yeah. I, I think I got started a little bit later. <laughs> I got started way earlier. Way earlier. <laughs> way earlier. So, well, I want to thank you. I mean, it takes so much courage to share, and I know you have been so open. And, um, you know, I know that you're going to help somebody. I hope somebody listening here that it really helps them. And, you know, God has really put you out there. I think for this, um, to be a warrior and, and you are definitely, you know, walking like Jesus with this being vulnerable and, and loving on people and accepting people. Thank you. Thank you. Trying my best. You are. So, all right. Well, thank you, Jill. I appreciate you spending time and everybody I'll link Jill's information below so that you can get her Instagram and get the support that you need. And um, I'll link my regular stuff below um, as well if there's anything I can help you with with grief recovery. So with that, thank you all for joining us today. If you are inspired by this podcast, leave a review and share it with your friends. You can always connect with Julianne Williams at juliannewilliams.com.